We all suffer sickness or loss in this world. We have financial ups and downs. We have ups and downs in our health. And we lose loved ones as the years go on. When the down times come and these bad things happen to us, we have examples in Scripture to help us. The Scriptures help us put things into proper perspective and to find comfort. The Bible helps us understand why bad things happen, and it helps us have faith that God cares for us and that God offers a better future for us. One of those comforting portions of Scripture is the book of Job. It's common for people to use the expression, the patience of Job, when describing someone who has suffered a lot. That terminology refers to the man, Job, in the Bible book bearing his name. Why do bad things happen to good people? A close look at the book of Job will help us understand and find comfort. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for making the opportunity available for your people everywhere to gather together in one way or another, either in person or remotely, to honor you, to worship you, to hear your word, and to sing songs of praise, exalting you. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the privileges of worship and the privileges of being instructed from your word. Please bless now this time together and bless each one who joins us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join in singing Sweet Hour of Prayer.
Some 2,000 years ago, the disciples gathered around Jesus and asked him to teach them how to pray. And the words that he gave them have come to be called the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer. Christians down through the centuries have recited this as their own personal prayer. Let's do so together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Bible Nook ministry hosts a weekly remote Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesdays. You're welcome to join the informal study by phoning 951-799-9542 on Wednesday evening or by clicking the Zoom link that's posted on Facebook. Bible Nook also provides free online resources in the form of websites at a dozen different domain names. At the tobbible.com domain, we provide a free modern Bible translation online that's copyright free, the original Bible for modern readers. <clears throat> the Bible we provide at bibleforthendtimes.com can also be read or downloaded online and features footnotes highlighting and discussing passages on the end times, the last days, and other important prophecies. At doorstepbible.com, we provide a free Bible in digital PDF format, also with footnotes that enable you to answer Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to your door. Our answerjw.com website provides other extensive resources on that cult, including a free online version of the book, How to Rescue Your Loved One from the Watchtower. Our leftbehindanswered.com website examines the Bible verses related to that controversial new teaching. And our UN versus IL.com website explores the roles of Israel and the United Nations in end times prophecy. Our comefollowjesus.net site offers an introduction to biblical Christianity for non-believers and new believers. And our main website, biblenook.com, provides links to all of the sites I just mentioned and features lots of other helpful material. Our videos of worship services and individual messages remain available for streaming at youtube.com slash Bible Nook and at facebook.com slash Bible Nook Ministry. These live stream services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. And they're also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We pay Facebook to boost our messages, and we pay Google to advertise our YouTube messages, with the result that the thought-provoking thumbnails, some of which you see here, reach millions of people. Toward the end of 2023, Facebook and Google reported more than a quarter million total views for our message on Israel and Armageddon. A flood of responses and comments, including from many non-believers and many comments from inside Israel itself, proved that this video got many people thinking and talking about the gospel message. The quarter million views reported for that message shows that for a very small ministry with a very small budget, Bible Nook reaches a very large audience. During the year 2023, 
we received gifts totaling $5,326, and we spent $5,875 on web hosting and domains, post office expenses, Zoom, and our call-in conference line, and overwhelmingly, we spent that money on boosting messages on Facebook and YouTube. As you can see, we had a shortfall for the year of $549, but my wife and I were glad to cover that from our own personal funds to keep boosting messages that were generating so much interest. No one takes any salary from Bible Nook. To maintain our freedom of speech, we have not applied to the government for their approval as a ministry. But all the gifts we receive go directly to the expense of spreading Bible messages. If you are being blessed by this ministry, or if the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on our gospel outreach, you can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page, or by sending a check to Bible Nook, 214 Onset Ave, Suite 1464, Onset, Massachusetts, 02558. Today's scripture reading is from the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 1, beginning with the ninth verse. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household? and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Let's join together now in singing, This is My Father's World.
We all suffer sickness or loss in this world. We have financial ups and downs. We have ups and downs in our health. And we lose loved ones as the years go on. When the down times come and these bad things happen to us, we have examples in scripture to help us. The scriptures help us to put things into proper perspective and to find comfort. The Bible helps us understand why bad things happen, and it helps us have faith that God cares for us and that God offers a better future for us. One of those comforting portions of Scripture is the book of Job. It's common for people to use the expression, the patience of Job, when describing someone who has suffered a lot. That terminology refers to the man, Job, in the Bible book bearing his name. Why do bad things happen to good people? A close look at the book of Job will help us understand and find comfort. There are a lot of things we don't know about the book of Job. We don't know who wrote it. Because it's a very old part of the Old Testament, some people theorize that Moses wrote it. We do know, though, that it's very old. We can't say for sure who wrote it. But we know that it's very old because the Bible book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament refers to Job as an historical person who lived prior to Ezekiel's time. It quotes God as saying, If I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, says the Lord, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. So we know from that reference in Ezekiel that Job lived before Ezekiel's time, and that Job was a very good man, right up there with Noah and Daniel. The New Testament writer James also mentions Job, where James writes, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job. Aside from that, we don't know much about the man Job, except what we read in the book of Job itself. So let's begin reading it. Job is found near the middle of the Bible, just before the book of Psalms. And as we begin reading at Job 1.1, we notice that Job lived in the land of Uz. It was a Gentile land, mentioned elsewhere in the Bible books of Jeremiah and Lamentations. The land of Uz may have encompassed the western end of the Australian, or rather the Arabian, peninsula. In any case, Job was not an Israelite. He served as priest for his family, and there's no mention of the Jewish Aaronic priests or the temple in Jerusalem where they served. So Job likely lived before the nation of Israel came into existence. This is how he's introduced. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So we've met the man Job. He was a nice guy, like any of us who love the Lord. But as we go on, we read about the source of the trouble that was about to come into Job's life. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, 
from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Just as we don't know a whole lot about Job, we also don't know a whole lot about Satan. He had been walking about on earth, but now he entered into a meeting of the angels, the sons of God in heaven. At this point, though, Satan was already a fallen angel. He had already become a bad guy. From what we read elsewhere in Scripture, it appears he used to be a good angel. Isaiah 14, 12 apparently refers to Satan when it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Revelation and Ezekiel seem to indicate that this Lucifer, who became Satan, was originally a good angel back at the time when God created the earth and that God had placed him in charge there. He was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Ezekiel chapter 28 says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the Garden of God. But then he spoke to them through a serpent and led them into sin. Revelation speaks of that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Sin led to death for Adam and Eve, and the inheritance of death for all of us, their offspring. Ezekiel adds in verse 14, You were the anointed cherub who covers. So Lucifer was the cherub or angel God had placed in charge, but he abused his power. If that had happened in a human context, a man placed in charge in a human government who abused his power and made a huge mess of things, he would have been impeached and put on trial. And apparently that is what happened with this Lucifer who corrupted himself to become Satan. But the process of impeaching him, convicting him, and finally removing him from power is a slow process. Second Peter 3.8 tells us, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Convicting Satan in the courts of heaven and then removing him from power takes a long time from a human standpoint. When Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness, he offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, which he still held in his power. And at John 14.30, Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this world. And at John 16.11, Jesus said, The ruler of this world is judged. But Satan won't be removed from power until Jesus comes back in power as king of God's kingdom and replaces Satan's human governments with the kingdom of God. So as we continue reading at Job 1.8, keep in mind that Satan came in among the angels at that heavenly meeting as an accused criminal who was already facing trial and punishment. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? God pointed out Job's faithfulness and righteousness. Perhaps this was part of the evidence against Satan, that Satan had no excuse for his bad behavior, since a man like Job could maintain good behavior. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan charged that Job was faithful to God only because God blessed him, but that Job would curse God if those blessings were removed. Was this part of Satan's legal case? Was he trying to get himself off the hook 
by accusing other individuals? Revelation 12.10 calls Satan the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. Satan accused Job, and then God replied to his accusation. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Apparently, Satan had some legal right to demand that Job be tested like that. Otherwise, it's hard to imagine why God would listen to him and allow what Satan demanded. In any case, whether we understand why or not, God accepted the challenge and allowed Satan to take away Job's wealth and his children. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. So Satan failed to prove his case. Job remained faithful. And God pointed that out to Satan. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a man blameless and a bl blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. God pointed out to Satan that he had failed. Job remained faithful despite Satan's attacks. But Satan wasn't finished with Job yet. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. <clears throat> so now Satan was demanding to put more pressure on Job. I should mention here that we need to be careful when we quote scripture. We need to pay close attention to notice who is speaking. Some of you may remember years ago when the first human heart transplant was performed by Dr. Christian Barnard. Some people apparently questioned whether such a thing should even be done, removing a beating heart from one person and transplanting it into someone else. So when Dr. Christian Barnard was talking to the news media, he quoted scripture to justify what he had just done. And the scripture Dr. Barnard quoted was this from the King James Version of the Bible. Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Many who heard that on the news must not have realized that Dr. Barnard was quoting the devil. He got away with it because he quoted scripture out of context. The whole verse, Job 2.4, 
reads like this in the King James Version. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. That's a perfect example of quoting scripture out of context. The famous doctor quoted Satan as if that's what the Bible was teaching. There are other places, too, in the book of Job where other speakers are speaking. They may not be the devil, but they are not speaking the truth. So we need to check the context before quoting. For example, Job's three friends who came to comfort him talk at great length from Job chapter 4 onwards. They try to blame the disasters that Job suffered on sin in his life. That's an element of the false health and wealth gospel that's taught in some churches today. One of Job's friends tries to blame the death of Job's children on sin in the children's lives. At Job 8.4, Bildad, his friend, says, When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But the deaths of Job's children had nothing to do with sins on their part. As we know from that meeting of God's angels, where Satan came in among them and demanded to test Job, it was Satan who killed Job's children by sending a windstorm that collapsed a building on them. Hebrews 2.14 refers to Satan as the one who can cause death. Toward the end of the book of Job, God condemns the false things that Job's friends said. God says to one of Job's three friends, I am angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken the truth about me. Yet much of the book of Job consists of the words of these three false friends. So we need to consider the context when quoting scripture. Quoting Job's friends would be almost as bad as quoting Satan. As we continue to look at what happened, we can see God's response to Satan's challenge. Since Job remained faithful to God after losing his wealth and even his children, Satan wants to impose more suffering on Job. Satan says to God, But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Again, it seems that Satan must have had some legal right to demand that Job be tested further. We don't know much about such matters. Was this part of Satan's legal case? Was he still trying to get himself off the hook by accusing other individuals? Deuteronomy 29.29 29 tells us that there are secret things that are the Lord's business, but that are none of our business. We do know a little about heavenly legal issues. We know Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross in order to lift the penalty of sin from our shoulders. Apparently, there were heavenly laws that demanded such a high price be paid. We don't know all the heavenly legalities that applied in the case of Job and the demands that Satan made. But it seems that those legalities resulted in God allowing Satan to proceed. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. 
And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground, seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Job lost everything he had, and now he was sick unto death. But he responded at Job 19, 25, and 26 by saying, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. As we read the rest of the book of Job, we see that Job was unaware of Satan's involvement. So Job misunderstood what was going on, but he still remained faithful to God despite suffering. Job questioned why he was suffering, but he still worshiped and praised God. He said at Job 121, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the next verse says, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. In the end, God rewarded Job with more blessings than he had before. Was Job's case unique, or does what happened to him explain what happens to us? Does it mean that every time something bad happens to us, the devil is behind it? No, the evidence proves that is not the case. For example, there are many times when I've been sick or in pain, and I know for sure it was due to ordinary causes. I ate something I shouldn't have and got a stomach ache. I got overconfident on the ice skating rink or failed to take precautions on a boat out on the water and I injured myself in such a way that the pain lasted for months. I caused those injuries myself so they were not attacks by Satan. And when it comes to disease, all mankind inherited sickness and death from Adam and Eve. So it strikes all of us sooner or later. But there are also cases where Satan puts us to the test, like Job. We can't always tell the difference. At Luke 22, 31, Jesus told this apostle Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have all of you to sift like wheat. Again, Satan apparently had that legal right. Otherwise, God would have ignored his demand. Like Job, the apostles endured many hardships and waited patiently for their reward. We have an example in what the apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian congregation. At 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul wrote about what he called a messenger of Satan. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Some commentators believe Paul's thorn in the flesh was trouble with his eyesight or a disease in his eyes. At Galatians 4.15, he told the Galatian congregation, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. And Paul had a secretary take dictation and write his letters for him. Paul signed them and sometimes wrote a brief note at the end in his own very large handwriting. In closing his letter to the Galatians, he said, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. 
Like Job, Paul endured all of that and a lot more faithfully. So when we face attacks by Satan, or just the problems that hit everyone in this world, the key thing is to trust God and remain faithful. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And 2 Corinthians 4.17 reminds us that our sufferings now are nothing compared to the blessings that God has in store for us. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Jesus endured the cross for us. He suffered pain and rejection and death so that we might be set free from our sins and gain eternal life. At John 16, 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And Christ will give us the power, too, to overcome the world and all of its trials and tribulations, even when bad things happen to us for no apparent reason, as in the case of Job. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us in your word this view into the unseen things that we don't see in this world, the things that are responsible for much of what happens. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us this hope, the hope in Christ, of an eternity with freedom from pain, freedom from death, freedom from sorrow. And we thank you, Lord, that this hope can carry us through as we wait for your coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's join together in singing Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride. Years I spent in vanity and pride Every night my love was crucified no, he thought it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploding turned to Calvary. Mercy that was great and grace was free. Pardon that was multiplied to me. There my burning soul found liberty at Calvary. At Thank you, Heavenly Father, for refreshing our souls with the wonderful truths found in your word. Help us, please, Lord, to treasure these things in our hearts and to share your gospel on our lips with all who will listen. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with this sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. 
Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. Our 7 p.m. Wednesday evening remote Bible study and prayer meeting is studying the book of Acts using the Bible itself as our textbook. It's very informal, and you're welcome to join us. Anytime after 6.45 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, just dial 951-799-9542 and you'll be connected. Or click the permanent Zoom link that's posted on Facebook. God bless. Keep safe.